Hey guys, it's me, Steph. Uh, if you are new here, I have bipolar disorder type one with psychotic episodes and uh, psychotic features and mixed episodes. So I have this channel where I talk about my life, my experiences with bipolar disorder in an attempt to help you guys better understand uh, what it's like or, you know, let you know you're not alone if you're someone with this illness. Um, so... I had a viewer ask about my story um, and I have told my story in my drink water notification. Um, <clears throat> I have told my story in four parts, four or five different videos. Um, if you go back to the very, very beginning when I first started doing my blog, I was doing it daily. Um, <clears throat> I think you can sort videos by oldest. Um, if that's something you want to check out, but I will, I'll do it in this video. Uh, it's going to be a long video, so just to let you know. Um, so I had a lot of trauma in my life, uh, a lot of trauma. Um, I don't know if anyone in, in, in my family has bipolar disorder, so I don't know if it, if I got it from hereditary reasons or um, trauma, but I had an extensive amount of trauma in my life. I grew up in a very, very, uh, war zone type home. Um, and, uh, my dad got really sick. He got cancer when I was around 10 or 11 years old, maybe 12. My mother got really sick and she was hospitalized with, um, some intestinal issues, um, at a very young age. I moved schools from when I was eight years old to a different school. That was really traumatic. Um, I, I, uh, m my home life w was, there was a lot of fighting and, and yelling and screaming and breaking things and, and stuff like that. Um, and my parents got divorced when I was 14 years old. Um, my dad remarried a year later and I suddenly had, um, three more siblings, uh, which I already had two younger brothers. So, um, yeah, so, so I had this big step family, which, uh, that only lasted about a year. So two years in total, I think he dated her for a year and then, then they got married. Um, so it was really traumatic. And I started when I was 14 years old, right, right after my mom left, I started rebelling. So, um, the day that my dad told me my mom had left, I, I developed an eating disorder. I decided that I was going to use that pain to get skinny. So I only ate one meal a day for a few weeks, um, lost about 15 pounds, and um, was the beginning of an eating disorder. I had a binging starvation episodes where I wouldn't eat for four days, and then I would binge eat like everything in the refrigerator. and so I never was able to make myself throw up. I never could handle throwing up. It was just too hard for me. Um, but uh, bulimia is, is, an, is another form of eating disorder. Um, so, and actually that didn't really go away until college, the um, eating disorder. I, I started working out and just got too busy to, yeah. Um, but anyways, so, um, when I was rebelling, I went to school, someone offered me a cigarette, and I said, why not? My parents are getting divorced. I have an excuse. Um, somebody offered me weed. Why not? My life sucks. I don't have family anymore. Gotta pretty much watch after my brothers, because that's what my mom asked me to do. Um... You know, started drinking. I think I did acid a few times. Uh... It never really affected me though. It's weird, weird. Certain drugs didn't did not affect me. Um, I actually smoked weed for six months before I ever actually got high. So you know, where you're a kid and when you get high and you start laughing, and I just thought it was stupid. Like I did it because my boyfriend had done it, but I never was like, "Am I supposed to feel something?" Never really felt stoned. Um, so yeah, so um, around the time that I was sixteen. I, my first psychotic episode happened. Um, I started, 
I started and it, I don't remember a lot of it. Um, but I, I, I know I got really paranoid. Um, my brother told me that, um, I thought that Oprah was coming out of the TV and talking to me. I don't remember that. Um, but my, my family was noticing my strange behavior. Um, I remember just feeling really, really scared. Um, I was really, you know, I was really young. I was 16 years old. I remember feeling really scared. Like everyone was talking about me. Um, like, um, people were reading my thoughts. Um, just, just really strange stuff. And so I, the aliens, aliens were real. Aliens were, were watching us. Um, so this was going on. Um, and I started feeling this way and my family noticed they freaked out. My mom, my parent, my dad and my, my mom were divorced and my, I lived with my dad and my stepmom and my stepmom's two kids and my first stepmom <laughs> and, uh, three kids, uh, with her three kids and my two brothers. And my mom had come over and, um, she sat next to me on the couch and she told me I have cancer. Um, I have breast cancer and I have ovarian cancer. And she later told me that that was a lie. Um, but I just stared at her blankly and, and she started slapping me and like my mom had never hit me before. She's repeatedly slapping me in the face and going, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? I, well, and she had told me years later that, um, <clears throat> it was a lie that she never had cancer. Um, but I remember, I don't know if it was that night, but she drove me to Santa Barbara. We lived in San Luis Obispo County. She drove me to Santa Barbara and the whole time I'm looking at the sky because I think that aliens are watching us. And I thought that we were going somewhere to treat her, can her cancer, even though it was the middle of the night. So we get to the hospital in Santa Barbara. She takes me into the check-in counter. And I guess I figured out what was going on and I started screaming and I turned around and you know, the sliding glass doors, you know, you step in the, the magnet or whatever sensor opens the doors. I push them open. Um, and they do do that by the way. Um, I do believe that they do that. I don't think I had some superpower and I was able to push them open. Um, but, um, so I was admitted to the hall. I don't remember anything after that. All I remember after that is waking up in the hospital. It was a, it was a section that was like the mental ward. Um, the place was called Cottage Care. It was in Santa Barbara. And um, I remember is the first time I woke up, uh, they, the guy, one of the guys who worked there says, you know, um, here goes a menu, you can order something to eat. And I was like, oh, okay, so I'm ordering food and I'm pretty calm. I don't know how long I've been sleeping for. I, I don't know anything. Um, but I see the cameras, the security cameras, and I start freaking out and saying, oh, they're watching us. And so, you know, four other nurses come out and they pick me up and my arms and legs and they give me a shot, sedate me and throw me in a room. And I have maybe two memories after that one. We went on some kind of field trip. Um, I remember we were in some kind of uh, Hawaiian type burger restaurant. Um, so I remember that because I gave the DJ a bubblegum wrapper for whatever reason, you know, those hubba bubba um, gums and they have sayings on the wrapper. And for some reason I thought I had to give him that. Um, so that I maybe have three or four memories from the whole month that I was there. And, um, so yeah, so they, uh, diagnosed me with schizophrenia, probably because of the hearing voices part. Um, so they diagnosed me with schizophrenia, gave me four different medications, Tegretol, Halidol, and, uh, Respirol, and another one. Sent me home, uh, after a month, and I took the medication for a little bit, um, and it was making me constipated really bad. So like, 
they uh, just suggested that I take Metamucil. So one day my friend comes over, we're sitting out on the balcony smoking cigarettes because I still smoked. And I notice these little red dots underneath my skin on my hand. And I'm like, what are these? And uh, I had some Ashton. And um, so I show my dad and my mom comes over and she looks in the back of my throat and sees some giant blister. Uh, so they uh, take me to the hospital and they do an exam on me and they actually did like a gynecological exam. I don't know how to say that. And I just remember the doctor looking up at me saying, we need to admit her right away. <clears throat> So what happened to me was these medications um, caused me to have a severe um, breakout of rashes and blisters on the inside of my body and the outside of my body. So um, I was hospitalized in a hospital called Twin Cities for two weeks. My body was covered in blisters. My mouth had so many blisters on it that I couldn't even eat. Um, they had like bedpan they had you know um it was a horrible experience I'm, I'm 16 I actually had my birthday in the hospital turned 17 uh in the hospital so I had these blisters from head to toe they had to give me these special baths like I had to go um they would walk me down to this one area and give me these, some kind of salt baths or something and this because get the skin off because the skin was just coming off because the poison was inside. Basically, the, the medicine wasn't affecting my body. My body was rejecting it. So I had what was called Stephen Johnson syndrome. And you guys can search that in Google Images and you'll see how horrifying it is. Anyways, it has a 50% a uh, mortality rate. <clears throat> so I could have died. Um, when I got out of the hospital, I'm 17 years old, I had scars all over my body from, from these blisters. Um, my skin looked like cheetah skin because especially on the top of my legs, my thighs, just giant um, red marks. So uh, at this point, when they sent me home, because when, when I went in the hospital, they determined it was a medication and that they had to take me off all of this medication immediately and that I needed to see a different doctor when I got out, so got out of the hospital. Went to see my dad. I remember my dad taking me to a doctor and I didn't want to take any medication after this. I mean, understandably, <laughs> after what happened to me, they said that what happened to me, uh, developing Steven Johnson syndrome like that, it happens to one in a million. Um, Later found out that this type of rash is common with a lot of medications. Um, Tegretol, specifically, um, is what they thought caused it. Uh, so, so it was a horrible experience, really made me not want to take medication. I was misdiagnosed. I did not have schizophrenia, so um, that really put my parents off. They didn't really know what to do, so they weren't pushing, just thought, you know, this is a misdiagnosis. So then I got home. I started having another uh, freak out, um, like major, major freak out, um, delusional again. And uh, so my dad takes me to a uh, hospital in uh, San Luis Obispo. So I go there, they put me in the hospital there. Um, I'm, I don't know how long I'm there, but I do know that I ended up screaming and yelling in that place. So they put me, took off all my clothes and put me in one of those, um, they have like these these vest dresses that you can't hurt you can't hurt yourself with you know you can't it's not like a, you can't hang yourself with a sheet or anything like that it's like um, to protect you um, so they had me in a room for um, for however long they had me in there and uh, I remember staring at the walls and uh, seeing thinking that people's faces were in the wall, um, in patterns in the wall. And then, uh, yeah, crazy stuff like that. Um, so I don't really know what happened after that. I do know my dad took me to oh, one psychiatrist and I do remember him having a chalkboard in front of us and, and me saying, no, I don't want to take medication anymore after what had happened. And, um, he said, you have to, and he was very concerned and he like drew a picture of all these like uh, doors and windows or whatever. And he, he's saying, 
look, this, this is your brain. He said, all of these doors and windows are now open. So any time that you have a, a severe stress or whatever, you can go back through the, one of these doors, like it's already open. You can't close it. Um, but I just kind of, you know, like ignored him. And so at this point, I'm about 17 and, um, I had lost so much weight in the hospital because I was like on feeding tube and not feeding tube, but, uh, IV vitamins. And, um, they were giving me like, uh, Insure, which is like a protein milkshake that I had to drink through a straw because I had the blisters all over my mouth. Um, so this was my very first episode. Um, because bipolar disorder is cyclical. It comes and goes. Um, it, as you get older, the, the episodes get closer together. Um, but it can, it can be, you know, 10 years between episodes. That's why it's really dangerous when people go around saying that, oh, I have the cure for bipolar or don't eat gluten. And then they'll think that because they haven't been sick in eight months or whatever, that that's, they've found the cure when, when they haven't, they, that it's, it's in like remission, if you will, like it's like comes and goes. So, um, so I ended up going to another hospital. So this first episode, I'm in three hospitals, right? The one hospital in Santa Barbara, the next hospital in San Luis Obispo. Uh, and then, um, once I got out of that one, they sent me to a hospital up in San Francisco. This hospital was crazy. Um, there was a girl there who was homeless. There was, uh, I remember sitting at a table with these two other guys that were there and one of them had red marks all over his neck. And I asked him what happened to your neck? And he said that his girlfriend broke up with him and he tried to hang him, hang himself. Um, my roommate in this hospital said that her, uh, her dad was giving her heroin and, and raping her. And I don't, I don't know if that was true or not. I, I don't know if she was delusional or whatever. There was another chick in there who, uh, would have these really anger screaming and yelling anger fits. And I, I remember them, uh, uh, tying her to a bed, not tying her, but belt they have like buckles and to, to, to get her arms and legs so that she didn't hurt herself or anyone else. Um, so, so that hospital was, was pretty crazy. I was there for a week and I guess when they, um, when they discharged me, um, th this was a long time ago, you guys, <laughs> like, um, so people didn't know nearly as much about bipolar disorder, uh, back than as they do now. We didn't have as many treatments. There wasn't as much knowledge about it. You know, like in the seventies, they would put people in these, um, in these asylums and just leave them there like sixties, maybe. I don't know. I don't know when it was, but it wasn't that long ago that, that people like us were, were thrown in hospitals and left there to die, um, because they, they just didn't know what to do. So, uh, so yeah, so, uh, I was yeah so San Francisco so they when they discharged me they said oh she, she there's nothing wrong with her as is what I was told I don't I didn't talk to the doctor so yeah so I'm 17 leave the hospital everything's fine you know I I had a, a very depressive couple of years I started using drugs with my friends um well I had one friend who who used drugs and uh fortunately I do not have uh an addiction like that to to substances like I've never developed a, a severe addiction to and I've done a lot of drugs I've done crystal I've done uh they called it low battery they called it crank back then uh so so yeah so I did that I did, did basically everything except for heroin uh so I had gained a bunch of weight after I got out of the hospital because when I was in the hospital from the Stephen Johnson syndrome I, you know I'd lost tons of weight so when I got out I was super depressed I started working on like jack-in-the-box I was eating jack-in-the-box every day and I gained like 30 40 pounds um, so by doing crank, I, I lost the weight really quickly. So, um, that's how a lot of women can get addicted to it. Anyways, when, when the friend went away, I had no desire to do drugs again. It just wasn't there. Didn't need it. Didn't know how to get it. Just, it was gone. Um, doesn't work like that for a majority of people. 
so I do have my vices. Uh, it took me 30 years to quit smoking cigarettes and uh, I, to this day, am not able to quit drinking coffee. Most of our quit was like a, a month. Anywho, so that was my first episode. My second episode happened when I was 28 years old. And uh, that episode, oh my goodness. I uh, started hanging out with some really, uh, I, I had, I had, I think what started it was everyone at my job, well, I, I had graduated college with a marketing degree and when I thought, and I thought the world was just going to open up for me. I, you know, I spent seven years in college. I had to take all these extra classes because I placed really low because I basically dropped out of high school. I did get my diploma, but because of how sick I was, I basically dropped out. Um, but I went back to, and got my diploma. But, um, so when I, when I graduated college, I thought all these doors were going to all open first. It's going to be super easy for me to find a job at an ad agency, do what I wanted to do. And when I graduated college, that's not what happened. And then, uh, there was a big real estate boom working happening. And I made a lot of money where I worked. I worked um, at a place called Robbins Brothers where I sold engagement rings. It was a lot like a car dealership. Uh, when you're selling high price items like that, you make commission. I made commission. I was really good at sales. Um, so I made a lot of money. So um, I was in San Diego and everyone that I worked with was buying houses or apartments or whatever. So I decided it was a good idea for me to buy a condo all by myself, <laughs> which was a horrible idea. I think I was 26 at the time. Yeah, 26. Uh, way too young to be buying a, a, a piece of property in San Diego, which is now the, the most expensive place to live in the U.S., um, so the part, the property was a probate. So I had like a month, which means, uh, whoever owned it died and it went to, went to offspring or whoever. Uh, so it's a longer court process. So it was it like, took a month for me to, uh, get the actual place that I, that, that I was going to buy. And, and, uh, I had all this time to second guess myself and doubt myself. I got really depressed. My entire face broke, broke out. My body was reacting a horrible way. Um, it was a paralyzing depression and anxiety. I remember standing in the elevator with this guy and I remember thinking how I wanted to die. And I remember thinking like, how is anyone happy in this world? How am I ever going to be able to like get up and not want to kill myself in the morning? And, um, and uh, yeah, so um, I went through this major, major depression and uh, my mom had taken me to a doctor because I was so depressed. She took me to a um, counselor and I guess this counselor could prescribe medication as well. Um, or maybe she took me to a psychiatrist too and I just don't remember. But um, th this person had diagnosed me with depression um, I guess she didn't know all about my history. Um, and I barely remember it. Um, I do remember her uh, trying to talk to me as a counselor, or maybe she was, she was probably a psychiatrist. And she and I had told her how my parents had gotten divorced and my mom had, had moved out. And she said, well, aren't you, are you angry about that? And she's, and I was like, no. And she's like, but she left you. And I got so angry, I got up and stormed out of the office and she had given me um, take home Lexapro's like samples that the doctors get to give you. So I now know that when you have bipolar disorder and you're prescribed an antidepressant that can send you into a psychotic episode. So I took the Lexapro for a little bit and soon enough I was in full blown mania and psychosis. And this was when I was 28 years old. And this was during the time of MySpace. So MySpace is, is like a, uh, it's a social media very similar to uh, Facebook. Um, so I got on MySpace, started posting all my pictures. And, uh, you know, at one point I was going to be a band manager. Some guy asked me to manage his band and I was going to do that. And I just was like, so like I thought I could do anything and, but I wasn't thinking clearly at all. Um, it was, so there's hypomania and then there's mania. So 
when you're experiencing hypomania, you can feel very elated. Uh, you can have a lot of energy, you don't need as much sleep. Um, and for people with bipolar type two, that's kind of where it stops at hypomania. They, they don't ever go into full-blown psychosis. People like myself who have bipolar type one, we go into full-blown psychosis. So we have a complete break with reality where what's going on in our minds is not, is not real. Our reality is totally different from yours. It, it, it makes no sense whatsoever. So I was in full-blown psychosis um, and I was, um, you also have delusions of grandeur when you're in psychosis. Um, so I had felt a lot of empathy and compassion for people who were homeless that I had met that had walked up to me or whatever. But I think a big part of it was that people who were homeless were not telling me that I was crazy. They were not, they were humor. They were yeah, like, yeah, 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 I get it. You know, cause, cause they were either trying to take advantage of me or they felt the same way. Um, so during that episode, I would take all of my items with me when I like, when I left my condo, I would leave, I would take, you know, like all my books from childhood. I would take like every piece of makeup I had, I would get this big bag and take all of my stuff with me. And then I would end up losing it because I would black out while walking and uh, just leave it somewhere and not remember or give it to one day the guy at 7-Eleven says, here, he gave me all this stuff last night and it was like all of my stuff. And I blew through all of my money. I took out a home equity lo loan on my, um, on my condo. And so I think I got like $20,000 uh, and I spent all that right away. Uh, it was just gone within like months. I think I spent about eight months in this psychotic episode. My roommate who I had at the time had to move out. I'd stopped going to work, stopped paying my bills. I lived in my apartment with no electricity for about a month. So I didn't have any food, didn't have any money. Um, it, it was really bad. And then I guess, I don't know what happened. It just ran its course and one day I was somehow closer to reality um and so my dad showed up and came in and picked me up and moved me out of my uh condo i i abandoned it um because they were going to foreclose on it so that was my second episode uh i ended up moving back home was severely depressed and suicidal uh for eight months i had lost a really great job and i had to move home with my parents at 28 years old, 29 by that time, because I had my birthday when I was uh, out wandering the streets and hanging out with homeless people. I was bringing them back to my apartment. They were stealing my stuff. People were doing drugs in my place. I was doing drugs with them sometimes. Um, I would walk um, around. Uh, in the, like It's almost like there's no before, there's no future. There's just right now. Uh, when when you're in a psychosis of just right now. So I would go walk to the store and then get a great idea that I need to go walk to this different store. And I would be walking for hours and hours and hours and days even um, in later episodes. But um, so yeah, so this was, uh, that was the second one. Um, and then, uh, so yeah, so I moved back home, went through a severe, always following a psychotic episode is a severe, uh, severe depressive episode. Um, and usually it would take me a couple of years to pull myself out of uh, that depression and not be constantly thinking about the embarrassment and the shame and the guilt from hurting those around me and just, just the embarrassment and just the trauma of losing your mind. Like it is so traumatic to just lose your mind. And, and then you come back and, and you remember bits and pieces and, and you think to yourself like, how could I think that? How, what was it that took over my mind that, that made me think all these things. Um, 
So, uh, yeah, I, I remember I would drive down this windy road because my dad lived out in the country. And every single day I thought about driving off this one part of the road. There's a, 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 a drop off part. And every single day I would think about driving off of it. Um, and it was like, maybe today I'll do it. Maybe today I'll do it. And I never did it. And one day I was driving home and I was speeding, driving really recklessly because I, I just didn't care. It would have been a, it would have been a gift if, if my life had ended at that point. Um, and I spun around this corner. I turned onto a street and my car spun around, did a donut and ended up hitting, uh, hitting like a deer crossing sign. Um, and, uh, so I messed up my car and, uh, cause I, cause I think I didn't finish my thought earlier. I, I had had a really great job in, in San Diego, uh, where I made a lot of money. When I had to move home, I got this job where I was making like minimum wage and that, that was all I could get. So I couldn't even afford to live out of my parents' house, uh, move out of my parents, which was humiliating. I'd lost everything. I lost everything. And I thought it was all my fault, you know, like I, like it was all my fault when really I, I had a severe mental illness and, and it was the illness's fault, not, not mine. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so I come around the corner, my now husband, uh, who we were always friends, we met when I was really, when we were both 21. Um, after, because I thought for sure I was going to die when, when I pulled around that corner and I was speeding and I hit that sign, I, I thought I was going to die. So, um, but I didn't, I drove home and I remember my now husband called me that night and I was like, you know, I just, I hate it here. You know, I'm never going to get out of here. And he said, well, why don't you move to L.A. and you can rent a room. I have an extra room. You can rent a room from me because we weren't dating or anything. We broke up years earlier. And so I was like, OK, so that was an out for me. So I moved in I moved to L.A. and uh, he, he I kept applying for jobs and I oh, I did get a job. I got a job. Uh, I applied at a, at a jewelry store. No. The first job I got was some telemarketing job, which lasted all of 22 days, maybe. And then I quit and I was like, this is ridiculous. It was some weird telemarketing job and it was just like not a real job. So um, I quit that job and I got a job at a different jewelry store, which oh, this was so humiliating. I had gotten arrested in my second episode a couple of times. Uh, one for being outside of a 7-Eleven and making a crazy ruckus. And uh, so I got trespassing. I had gotten a ticket for riding the trolley, or I had gotten a, a, a fine for riding the trolley um, without a ticket. Um, and I had gotten arrested for stealing a backpack out of a car. I thought that this backpack was for me. I, I thought that it was mine, like it was left there intentionally for me. That was my thought process. But the person I stole it from saw that I had done that. And so they called the cops and the cops showed up and I got arrested. Um, so I had this record. So when I applied for the, the jewelry store, um, it was in like Westminster, uh, which is in LA County, I uh, applied for this job, it was like a crappy jewelry store. It was Zales, which is like, ugh, it's like um, low end mall jewelry store. And I, I had worked in this, you know, fancy, um, a fancy diamond ring store before. They only sold engagement rings and, and stuff, only sold diamonds, nothing else. So now I was working in this store that sold watches and this crappy jewelry store and it wasn't making any money. And uh, when I applied, I, the part where it says, have you ever been arrested? I put no. So one day I go into work and uh, I had already been hired, but uh, I go into work and the manager's there and I'm like, oh, that's interesting. What The district manager, the one who had hired me. And I thought that's interesting. Why is he here? So he pulls me to the side and he's like, hey, um, this is, is this you? All of these offenses, all of these arrests? Because I had a 
record. And so I had to say, yeah, it's me. And he's like, okay, you're fired. So I got fired. Uh, and then I got some other shitty job after that working for this lady who was like a full-blown alcoholic um, and crazy lady. Man, she was like, yeah. She was just... Anyway, so it was really difficult for me to find a job. Anyway, long story short, my husband ended up getting me uh, on this, getting me into this site that had listed a bunch of internships. So I applied for an internship and that actually turned into a job. The guy that interviewed me for the internship said, well, you're a little above beyond, beyond internship, but I can maybe get you a job. So that's how I got my job working as a media buyer, which I did for eight years. Um, but after five years, I had my third episode. Um, I was living on my own in Santa Monica. And um, all of a sudden, one day, my my brain, I think there was a short period of hypomania where I thought I could do anything. Um, I got really into my, into music. Um, every time I got sick, I would get really into music, but I wasn't into music before then. Like I, I would even go around singing, um, to random strangers. And, um, because that would happen when I was sick, when I got better, I didn't want to play my piano because I thought if I did that, I was going to be get sick again. So it really affected the one thing that I am most passionate about. Um, so yeah, my third episode, kind of the same thing, only this time it was super, super humiliating because this was an, uh, a little short period of hypomania and then psychosis again and delusions of grandeur, thinking that I have special powers. Or And, and, this, and during this episode, I thought that I had um, millions of dollars in, in a bank account that didn't exist. Um, but I, I knew I had $500 million or whatever. And uh, I didn't have any any house to pull money out of or anything like that. I just had this shitty apartment. But I basically, I, I wandered the streets a whole bunch and I kept going to my work saying crazy things. Um, they had to actually hire security specifically for me at my job because I kept showing up there. Um, so humiliating, right? <laughs> So yeah, so a company of 100 people all knows about Stephanie, the crazy lady that keeps showing up at the job. They have to hire a special, special, uh, a special security for her. Um, so yeah, it's a miracle that I, I didn't lose that job. Uh, I didn't have any money. I'd spent all my money. I wasn't working, wasn't going to work, wasn't paying my bills. Um, and my now husband showed up with paperwork for FMLA, which is Family Leave Medical Act, and somehow convinced me to sign this paperwork so they could not fire me. My previous job, they were able to fire me because I never filled out, I refused to fill out the paperwork for that. But if you experience a, a medical crisis for you or someone in your family, you can get in, the, in California, you can get something called Family Leave Medical Act. So they were not able to fire me. So uh, after I got hospitalized, I was hospitalized. I, one of the times I showed up to work, one of my friends, a really good friend, um, <laughs> was had, had it was sick of them calling the cops on me. I had showed up again and she came out and she's like, come on, let's go. And so she took me and we went somewhere to eat. And then somehow she convinced me to go to the hospital. So she takes me to the hospital. They uh, interview me for like, I don't know how long they interview me and then they um they hold me for 72 hours and that 72 hour hold turns into a week hold turns into a two week hold and we have the right to refuse medical care but we have to prove that we're not a danger to ourselves or others so i actually had to go to court a few times before i got out of there and i because i was still refusing to take medication so i got out of there um after about three weeks my friend who who I just made amends with, I talk about that in uh, the last video I did, uh, which I can put a link down below for. Um, she um, had written a letter about all the crazy things that I had said and done 
because I was saying crazy stuff and doing crazy things. Um, I was delusional. I, um, yeah, completely delusional. And that time I got arrested for stealing a shirt at, um, at the store near my dad's house. Uh, again, I, I thought it was mine. It was put there for me. I didn't know I was stealing it and, uh, cause I was delusional and, uh, I had this imaginary boyfriend that was that had bought me this store. Uh, he 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 bought the store for me, and it was my store now. And uh, it was some guy that I had met that really didn't want anything to do with me. But in my head, he, I had told myself he was still my boyfriend. So yeah, so uh, you know, after all this crazy stuff with my third episode, the stuff that happened again, I was hanging out with homeless people. Um, my dad and my brother came down to try to help me one time. That I think I only remember them pulling into to my driveway, and I remember telling my dad that I wouldn't back down, screaming that at him because it was from a Tom Petty song and that's where I got that. There was some reason why I was saying that relating to Tom Petty. Just, your mind is so crazy and confused um, when you're in psychosis because you're not in reality. So I can remember bits and pieces of things, but I can't remember why necessarily. It's only some delusions I can remember. One delusion that I had was that, um, and this is gonna sound really crazy, you guys, that my mom was actually Madonna and that my dad was actually Michael Jackson. Um, and that they didn't live that they didn't, I wasn't supposed to know that's who they were because they wanted a normal life for us. Absolutely insane delusional things. Like it's almost like tied between fantasy and fear. Um, and so, uh, so, um, yeah, so um, I finally came out of, uh, after being in the hospital for three weeks at UC, uh, I think it's, it's UCLA, UCLA, uh, they're actually a really good hospital and they will uh, actually keep the, because they're a teaching hospital, so they'll actually keep the person with mental health issues much longer than any other hospital will. So luckily that's where I got taken. And uh, yeah, it took me three weeks to um, to get myself out of there. And even when I got out, I still wasn't wasn't sane. Um, I was close, maybe maybe sixty five percent back to sane, and I slowly came back to uh, normalcy after um, after probably a couple couple of months. And so I was on. Um, I had was on Family Leave Medical Act. I had managed to get a uh, short-term disability. And then um, I, I went back to work and I remember in order to go back to work, I had to meet with Human Resources and the CEO of the company. And uh, so I remember sitting in the office next to Human Resources and the CEO of the company. And this time I had, was the, I was experiencing my third episode. So this time I was like, okay, you have to take medication. That's clear now. So I went to psychiatrist. Psychiatrist didn't really didn't explain shit to me about bipolar disorder. He basically gave me some pills and sent me on my way. Um, so I took the pills. It was Abilify, ten milligrams, which is a uh standard amount for someone with depression, someone with bipolar disorder, it's too low and it can actually send the person into a psychotic episode. So I remember sitting in the office with my C with the CEO and human resources and she's saying, well, you can come back to work, but you are taking your medication, right? You have to take your medication if you want to come back. So this conversation that I had to have, humiliating conversation in order to get my job back. And we had just hired an assistant for me prior to me uh, having my psych psychotic breakdown. And so she was really pissed when I got back because she had to learn everything by herself. And um, 
I was so severely depressed after this. I just wanted to kill myself every day. I just wanted to die. I drank every day. I would go to Rite Aid and buy a couple of bottles of wine and drink a bottle of wine a night. I couldn't cook for myself. So I would go to work, sit there at my desk, basically do nothing because I had put in my head that, and it's probably true, that they were never going to promote me. I was going to be stuck a media buyer forever because they, because how could they trust me after I went through, through that psychotic episode and put the, I was working with big clients with a lot of money, um, media buyers, they place ad spots for um, big companies. So I was taking companies, you know, $10 million budgets and placing their, their advertising. Um, so I knew that I was never going to go anywhere in that position. I hated that job. Part of the reason why I had my psychotic episode in that episode is because that episode is because I, I believe strongly is because one, my mom had set me off because we were estranged, but also because um, I was sitting there staring at my boss one day and I was like, I wasted my life in this job. I like she would be what I her job would be what I would be striving for. And I don't ever want to have to deal with what she has to deal with. I don't want her job. Shortly after that, I went into my psychotic episode. But yeah, so going back three years, three years I spent like that. I would buy lottery tickets every day. They used to have the set for life. So I would buy these $10 lottery tickets every single day and uh, hope that I won set for life. That was the only thing I had to cling to. The money was the only thing that was going to make me happy. Looking back, that's ridiculous. Money makes no one happy ever. Um, it's nice to have money and it's good to feel secure, but I would much rather feel love from my family and be broke as shit and not have enough money to pay my bills and have a family that loves me and wants to spend time with me versus having plenty of money and no love. Um, but at the time, I was so deep in my depression um, that... I literally just wanted to kill myself every single day. And I intended on keeping to take the medication, um, even though it was the wrong medication for me. But uh, one day I called up for my psychiatrist to make an appointment and he had died during a routine stress test. And uh, so I had to find a new psychiatrist. I found a new psychiatrist and this woman, I remember sitting in the psychiatrist's office and she was asking me, do you want to harm yourself? I was embarrassed to tell her, I want to kill myself. I think about it every day. So now I'm incredibly honest with my psychiatrist. But at the time, I was embarrassed to tell her that I was suicidal. Um, I was embarrassed to tell her that I was drinking every night to deal with my pain and that I had to eat out every night, I only ate once a day because uh, sometimes I'd eat twice a day, but I had to eat out every single time because I was too depressed to cook for myself, too depressed to go to the grocery store. Um, sometimes I didn't even shower before work. I smoked pot every single day and I drank a bottle of wine every single day and I bought multiple lottery tickets every single day because I would buy a set for life for $10, win a ticket, and immediately go back to the store and trade that in on the same day. And sometimes I'd go back to the store three or four times in one day, just trying to win money, buying these lottery tickets, hoping that it's going to solve all my problems. So um, for those three years that I wanted to kill myself um, after I had gone psychotic and completely humiliated myself and in front of everyone I worked with, um, and um, to give you an example of how entirely depressed I was, we went to, um, we would, the, the networks like ABC and NBC, we would give them money, right, from our clients to place our advertising spots. So it was national TV. It was like the commercials you see on TV. Um, so they would always take us out to lunch, fancy lunches and schmooze us and stuff. So I remember one time going to lunch with me and two or three of my coworkers, and we're all sitting there at the table and um, I really didn't, I didn't say anything the entire time. And um, cause I didn't talk when I'm super depressed, I, I don't talk very much at all. I'm just constantly thinking, having negative thoughts in my brain about myself and um, feeling miserable. 
I remember driving back and I remember my boss saying, Stephanie didn't say anything the entire lunch. And in front of everyone, like putting me on the spot. And I remember just feeling so humiliated. Um, and so like, God, why, why, what's wrong with me? Why can't I just be like everybody else and be happy? And so, um, so yeah, that was my third episode. And up, I don't think I had ever experienced any um, hypersexuality in these three episodes. No, that's not true. Not when, not in my third, but in my second, I did um, have sex with a few random strangers because I was experiencing hypersexuality, which I have other videos talking about that. Um, I can put a link down below for one, um, but I'm not going to get into that. But hypersexuality is basically a symptom of mania and it is not nymphomania, but it is uh, like that. The difference is it goes away when you're no longer psychotic. Um, it's an overwhelming desire to have sex, look at sexual materials like porn or whatever, uh, masturbate. It, that's what hypersexuality is. Um, so I didn't experience that in my uh, in my first episode or my third episode, but I did in my second episode and in my fourth episode. Um, so yeah, I lost uh, one, two, two jobs because of my mental illness, um, but I didn't just lose the jobs. I completely humiliated myself in my workplace. I would always go back to my workplace when I worked at... Robbins Brothers, the jewelry store, I, I went in there full-blown manic a couple times, embarrassed myself in front of everyone that I worked with. Um, and all of this stuff, these consequences, you have to deal with them. And for people like us, it's... It's a... It's a life long trauma it doesn't it doesn't go away it's like um <sighs> you do everything you can to keep going um, and your only option, right, is to, like, kill yourself or power through. So, um, that's what I do. I power through, try to find things that bring me joy, try to remember that I'm in the here and now and all of that is in the past. And, um, but it's hard because I, I do, I have post-traumatic stress syndrome from all of the things that I've seen and experienced and, uh, my fourth episode was the worst. Um, when I was having um, all that depression, when I had gone back to work as a media buyer, when I was having all of that depression and wanting to kill myself and being too afraid to tell my psychiatrist and being humiliated at work, my now husband was showing up every weekend and taking me to the movies or take, and taking me to dinner. We would hang out every single weekend. He was the only one that I trusted that um, didn't judge me, still wanted to be around me, um, even though I was miserable, depressed. Because when you're depressed, nobody really wants to be around you because they can sense it. They can feel it. Um but he was he was always there for me so i got really used to having him around and uh three years later uh following my my episode um he and i got really close i i um eventually quit my job at the ad agency because i knew it was never going to go anywhere for me and they had uh promoted everyone in the department except for me and i just was so humiliated i just could not work there anymore so I decided I was going to move back in with my parents and I was going to get whatever job I could. So again, I took a job where I was making decent money, quit, and went to go to another minimum wage job. 
worked for another ad agency where my boss was crazy tough on people and uh, I was still having suicidal thoughts. Uh, my plan was to drive to the Target parking lot and drink uh, gallons of water and you can kill yourself by drinking too much water. Um, so that was my plan. I didn't have access to any pills. Um, I remember one time driving one of the kids, um, I think my sister somewhere, uh, or yeah, I had to remember my little sister. She was, she was young then, she was just a kid. And I remember knowing that my dad had a gun in his truck and just fantasizing about pulling over and just blowing my head off. And uh, yeah, so it w my life has really been um, normal, crazy, recovering from crazy, normal for a little bit, crazy, recovering from crazy, and you know and then so my fourth episode happened right after my husband and I got married and that episode was the worst um one morning I woke up and I was convinced that my husband had a secret life with another woman and he was his ex he had a secret life with his ex and uh it just got really really bad really bad um so many bad things happened. I, um, I had met this guy outside of 7-Eleven and I was convinced that he was going to be my new husband. I was hypersexual, so I was cheating on my husband. Um, I, at the time I thought, you know, that he, that he had a secret life with someone else. Um, but I had accused him of beating me. The cops kept showing up at the at the house. Um, and this was a few months after we got married. The The wedding was, I had just come out of a severely depressive episode and the wedding was um, really stressful. And after the wedding is, is when a couple months, we got married in September and by October I was in manic. Um, November, November. And he had taken me to a couple of different hospitals. He had taken me to one hospital. I got admitted. When I got out, I didn't want to take the medication because the hospitals never keep you long enough. So when they let me out, I was still psychotic. And uh, so I didn't want to take the medication. So it just got worse and worse and worse. And I would walk, 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 walk. So it's, it's end up barefoot walking around the city like homeless person. And uh, my husband, low battery again. Um, my husband again had to, um, he, he had to get a restraining order against me because I kept saying he was beating me and the cop showed up and said, listen, you have to get a restraining order against her or the next time we show up, we're going to arrest you. So I was hospitalized about four or five times during that episode. Um, my husband had, um, like I said, when you're sick like that, you black out. And uh, I think my husband's home, so to be continued.